My name is James, I'm from ADN Import Foods, uh, my colleague Anthony there as well. So we're, uh, we're focused on the mainland China market, um, which we get a show of hands, we know a few people that are currently trading in China. Oh. <laughs> a couple of them, great. And who, who are you interested in, in the Chinese market? A few of you, I guess, that's great. So hopefully we can, um, we can tell you a little bit about the market. Um, and how, how we approach it. So, so we work with established brands as well as uh, new up-and-coming brands. Um, <clears throat> an example there, uh, we work with Sugar Pova, who is Maria Sharapova's sweet range, uh, as odd as that might sound. Um, we, we work with her. We, we relaunched it at the China Open um, in Beijing back in, uh, back in October. Um, so certain challenges around getting through customs and labor regulations, but uh, yeah, that's one example. Um, uh, from from our backgrounds, uh, I think I touched on it earlier on. So uh, I was actually born in Hong Kong, lived there for eight years. Uh, I then also worked in Shanghai for, for a short stint. Um, so really, you know, always interested in, in the China market on a personal level. Um, Anthony, who, who we met at university, went out there uh, initially to play a bit of ping pong. Uh, stayed there on and off for 10 years. <laughs> when you lose the 12 year olds all the time on tape, it's like, yeah, it's, we'll go back to England and play. <laughs> but um, obviously now, now the food, food industry, the, the right place. But uh, yeah, so um, fluent Mandarin, uh, started off a, a recruitment business out there, so really knowledgeable about the culture and the way the Chinese do business, which is uh, you know, unique to itself. Um, I myself worked at Instant Drinks, as I, as I mentioned, and we, we basically uh, connect the dots in terms of uh, helping food drink brands uh, get to China um, and open up those channels. So uh, this is just an example of us at the uh, FHC. Uh, at, uh, FHC in Shanghai last uh, last November. So um, we represented a number number of brands there. Uh, really good. Uh, first show, so you know, 12 to 18 months old, so fairly new, so that was our first show. Um, really good responses from, from brands. We're actually in the process now of doing all the, all the follow up, the, the exciting pieces. So um, that's that's ultimately what we want to do you know, get, get products in front of buyers uh, and open up those channels. So, just thought I'd touch on the, the scale of China. We all know China is a huge country, 1.4 billion. But sometimes, you know, the, the scale is something we don't usually comprehend. So each of those dots you can see there represents 100,000 people. Um, so it's a, it's a huge, huge country. What's interesting though is, is it's mainly on the on the east coast there. So 94% of the population, um, you know, in that, in that eastern coast territory. So uh, that's really where where the opportunity is. Although there's a lot of growth happening in, in central and the west. Um, uh, in terms of what does the uh, macro environment look like uh, in terms of population, so there's a huge growth we've seen. There's been a lot of growth in, in recent years, um, which is trickling down into this exploding middle class. So you're going to have uh, by 2022 56% of of the 1.4 billion into this upper middle class. So more more money to spend, um, which is great great for everyone, um, and. Uh, and that's that's the, that's the real shift there. That they they've got more money to spend on themselves. It's also um, there's a there's a big drive in the Chinese economy. Um, it's, it's been on growth for you know the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, now there's a big five-year plan in China on on pushing consumer spending. So having a, a, a greater per capita spend. Um, one point to note though, um, with regards to this, you know, upper middle class and this. Uh, two, three hundred million people that are going to be having that money to spend, where they spend it. The reason why they spend uh, a lot of money on imported food is because there is a lack, lack of trust in their own quality of, of food. So there's been many food scandals over the years. Um, you know, the, the high profile uh, baby milk scandal, um, of course, um, which is actually happening, happening now in France, I think not. Uh, but but more, more so than that. So you've got exploding watermelons. You've got pork that glows blue, um, clearly, clearly shouldn't. So there is that lack of trust, and certainly in certain categories, um, that, that's reflected in, in the way they spend the money. So baby milk, for example, as a result of that scandal, 70% of the baby food market is, is imported. 
So um, that gives the you know, opportunity for the food and drink. Living yeah. there as well, you hear a lot of stories about things like plastic eggs being made in factories in Shenzhen, um, oil that they take off the top of sewers and then sell back to just filter it and send it back to street vendors. So it's oh, these these are a couple of things that are crazy and interesting, but it's so widespread. It's sort of stuff that would happen in the Middle Ages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so widespread that it kind of has created two markets in China. So you do have the domestic market and then a quality imported market, and that's why imported food really demands that quality and that premium. Which is why people that have the money often will only buy imported food, especially well now it's a two-child policy, but feeding their kids and their health they don't have one, so they want to look after the kid and make sure it grows up healthy. And yeah. So yeah. Exactly right. Um, and just to reiterate on, on that scale, so uh, that's reflected in, in, in the retail environment. So you've got Starbucks heavily investing in China. They're opening one Starbucks a day for the next five years. Um, you know, they're not really doing that here, anywhere else. You've got JD.com, who are the second biggest online retailer. Um, huge space, but convenience is an area which is underdeveloped, and, and there's a lot of investment in there. And JD themselves are opening 100,000 convenience stores. Uh, over the next few years, so you know that that scale, you know, is really really evident there. Um, not a lot of places opening that that sort of number of stores. Uh, E-commerce, big boom. I'll talk about that in a little more detail uh, later. Um, but that's a that's a huge area. As as you know, uh, a lot of people live in high-rise buildings, very cramped conditions. So um, to go out to, to do your weekly shop um, isn't as convenient. Uh, when there's low costs of uh, low cost of logistics and delivery, food's coming. Everyone's uh, <laughs> looking forward to that. But yeah, the, the logistics in China is really cheap, so it makes sense to do impulse pur purchases or regular purchases through their mobile and get someone delivered to you. You know, with, with a very small small cost than it does to try and go into a weekly shop um, at, a, at a high market, which you know isn't cheap there. Um, <laughs> You also got it's quite high tech. So um, everyone saw the Amazon Go stall that opened up uh, recently, um, where you just walk in and walk out with your shopping, and it does automate automatically. That's one store that's that's brilliant. So uh, China are actually you know leading on this as well. So they've got these unmanned convenience stores, um, which again uh, through through your WeChat account etc. will know who you are. Step in, uh, collect the purchases. You'll step out and it will do it all automatically. So, as an example of the scale, you know, there's a, there's a brand Bingo Box which opened 5,000 across the country over the next couple of years. So, phenomenal growth there. Has anyone heard of um, Singles Day in, in China? Uh, so, it's their version of Black Friday. Um, Jack Alibaba, Jack Ma, um, founder, very, very clever guy, came up with this day where everyone can spend a lot of money um, and he's, he's done well out of it. Uh, so effectively, <laughs> this is the most recent figures on, on Singles Day, uh, which is 11-11, so 11th of, of November. Uh, 25 billion US dollars spent in one day online. Um, now, that is bigger than what Brazil spends in their online market over the course of a year, uh, to put it in perspective. And interestingly, 90% of that is, is through the mobile. So there's a lot of online markets, and um, it's, it's a huge... And these, spend, these are the numbers from Timor Singles Day. There's also JD.com, which is also a massive market shareholder. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they have their numbers as well. So. Exactly right. And what, <laughs> to put it in perspective, so you, you've now got one in every two pounds spent online globally is, is coming through through China. So that's it's phenomenal. Now, the interesting thing about a lot of the, the new markets here in India, some of the ways that shopping is involved in like an hour market. They're dismissing steps out. You know, they're, they're going you know, online because you know, it's taking off, and people don't want to get necessarily go into stores. And you know, the fact that they are living in high rise prices explains why. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Way more convenience. And and in terms of the break breakdown of, of, of online, what does that look like? So <coughs> as you can see, um, T Ball obviously had had the figures in the site before. They dominate the market. Um, Alibaba. Owns Tmall as well as Taobao, so that's they, they make up over 50% of the market. Then you've got uh, JD.com. Um, historically, it started out with electronics, but uh, they they bought um, they bought an online uh, company, Yihao uh, recently, so really pushing ahead in food as well. 
Um, and then there's, there's a bit of a, a breakdown there. To put it in perspective as to, to how, how, um, how important these platforms are, whereas here you might go onto an individual site to, to do a purchase. Um, Amazon, when they launched in, in China, they didn't launch on Amazon.cn. They launched as a platform on Tmall. Um, and, and, and so, you know, 90% of the traffic is all, you know, they'll go onto their phones, they'll, they'll do the search through the app of the platform, and that's why it's really important they, they effectively own the market. Um, so that's the, that's the e-commerce breakdown. In terms of uh, the, the retailer landscape, again, it's kind of a, bless you, <laughs> um, in, in terms of uh, the retailer landscape, it's also kind of a, a flip side of, of the UK. Um, so whereas you know, in the UK you've got your, your Tesco's and your Sainsbury's that, that dominate the, the retailer space, um, in China, the top 10 retailers, this is online and offline retailers, they still only make up uh, you know, 10% of the market. So it's very fragmented, and you need access to importers, etc., to get you out to, to the rest of the market. Um, so it's a unique uh, approach. And then in terms of how do you support, you know, obviously apart from the, the in-store branding and marketing support, uh, one thing to, to note is... The, the great viral of China, they call it, um, as you can you can see they're depicted. So every every great thing that you're doing in terms of uh, your, your online brand, so Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, etc., um, they're all blocked in China, um, and so they have their own equivalents. So you you, you need a, an online um, marketing strategy uh, or a partner that can you know that take care of that for you. Uh, so with Baidu, for exa example. Uh, you know, a Chinese website is, is all, always useful to think of. Baidu don't index English, so if you were to, to search, um, you know, uh, my flowers or anything like that, it wouldn't it wouldn't rank in the same way. Um, Baidu Baidu the, sorry, Baidu is the Chinese version of Google. Sorry, yes. yes. Is there, oh, there Baidu. Search Baidu. Baidu. So the one problem is the Chinese version of Google. You've got WeChat, which is the green little speech bubbles, which is kind of WhatsApp mixed with Facebook. It's really popular. It's the largest app everyone uses, um, but it's kind of used within networks, so people share posts that they can all see. And then Weibo, which is the one above that in the red, it's a nice little drawing, is kind of like um, Twitter, so you can put things out to everyone and they can see, kind of like Twitter and Instagram. So they have all their own versions for it. Exactly. Also, the Great Firewall of China slows down any website viewing, so if you have a website .com hosted in the UK, for example, then opening in China could take 30 seconds, and obviously no one waits that long anymore. It's the same going the other way. So if you try to open some Chinese websites, not CN websites, they just don't open for ages or at all. Um, so it's quite useful sometimes to have a Chinese CN website that's hosted the other side of the Great Firewall, which is that's cool. Yeah. And, and they're, they're always on it. So the average time spent on WeChat, um, our equivalent of WhatsApp, is four hours a day. Um, wow. You'll have that <laughs> on average. Uh, you'll be you'll be in the underground on the tube, um, and their tube all has Wi-Fi. Uh, even through the tunnels, um, which is great, but you are surrounded by people and they're all on WeChat, uh, which is normal. But yeah, it is more of a closed platform, um, so brand building initially is usually more useful on Weibo, uh, where you can broadcast your message and people can share and you can use influencers in the same way you would through Instagram, etc. Um, and WeChat stuff. Uh, <coughs> more, more brand building. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's fascinating, really. Like, you know, I think when you think of China, probably a lot of the Far East, it, it, it is a different culture, different way of working. And, you know, that's quite, it, it's kind of mind blowing. So, there's sort of the same set of rules that we would have necessarily all thinking about that doing business if the wall being flipped yeah. over here. And it's kind of that's why I would say it's, it's good to know people that know the market. Um, you know, you've got a language barrier as a, as a starter, but then just a completely different way of shopping and, and the habits is. Uh, they, they've really made product us yeah. in the sense that yeah. they developed so quickly, very recently, which means they're using the technology that we wouldn't have done and we developed in the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And it was you know, bullet trains and you know, yeah. paying with reach out and everything like that. It's really amazing. Yeah, and you do, you do get clusters. So uh, Shenzhen is, is you know, the tech cluster, so that's where all the you know, dr big drone companies are all based, and that's where all the, um, But then you also have you know, the head offices for all the retailers um, there in the Guangdong areas and things like that. So. Um, you know, relevant for you guys, uh, China's now the world's largest grocery market, um, phenomenal. Uh, the online market, which we touched on, is 
is actually greater than the next 10 combined. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge one to go after. Whereas typically, you might not have thought about it before. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly a good time to be thinking about Pad China. Um, you know, some research there that show that exporters, you know, grow at half the pace. And yeah, if you can uh, export effectively, um, then absolutely you'll, you'll reap the benefits. Um, and now, now's the time that you can look a bit further afield. Um, you know, China was probably a bit more closed off 10, 10 or so years ago. Um, the access to it is, is a bit better now. Um, and then just in terms of in terms of spend, you know, 105 plus billion spend on, on food and drink in China. So again, those exporting will, will have a share of that. Um, so a really, really good time. In terms of what does that look like for uh, for the retailers, um, and you know, Erica, etc., uh, they are responding to this demands. So what you're finding is the older generations, you know, that are drinking the cokes, etc. The younger generation coming through, um, they are more health conscious. Uh, they are trying to do things differently than their uh, than their parents, and so they are seeking out new and different products, which. It's good for everyone else because that's what the, the retail buyers are seeking. They're seeking something a bit different themselves that they can differentiate themselves. So, um, but yeah, they're sourcing the, the, the products that you know could, could shine here in Wales, the UK, etc. Um, typically, your you know your route to market would would be the finding um, you know, a, a great importer partner that you could you could work with, or you know try and find out there yourselves. Um, when we were in uh, FHC back end of 2016, we met uh, a couple of brands there who spent a lot of money on flights, on, on the show, uh, translators, etc. Got there, realised most questions that were being asked were, are you, are you ready for China, your label's done, etc. They didn't really have any idea about that. Um, some leads, but they've gone back home. You know, they filled out, fizzled out quite quickly. So it can be, can be slow, it can be expensive, um, you know, lots of, lots of challenging uh, challenging. Uh, ways to, to do it that way. Uh, now, um, you know, a China-based partner is always a really good idea. I think that was mentioned a couple of times. Whether it's you know Middle East, etc. You know, finding at least one one partner to, to help you there. Um, been the topic today. Uh, you know, getting your products compliant. You know, it's the same situation in China, although they have their own unique uh, rules and regulations. Uh, that is, you know, an absolute must um, to getting those uh, your ducks in order there. Um, and how, how we work is uh, we represent you, so having your sales information um, and debt translated. Uh, I think it was touched on previously around um, your importers not representing the brand in, in the best lights, and just going straight to price. Um, you know, to to actually have the uh, the ability to, to to tell your brand story is important in China, and so you, you need you need to, to go through that. Um, and then of course you know pushing the, pushing the sales. What does product compliance look like for the China market? Um, so the level of importance, we, we talked about 50% um, in the UAE earlier, um, goods destroyed. Of the goods destroyed at customs in China, 90% of those was because of incorrect uh, labeling. So it's absolutely you know, one to, to get, get done. Um, when, we, when we were doing the, uh, the launch at the Beijing Open, um, Shippopova, Came, came to us and said, please, please help us, we want to execute this, um, but gave us a very short time frame, so absolutely forced to uh, get, the, get the products on the ship and do labelling throughout. I can tell you that, yeah, it's definitely better to, to get your labelling and everything sorted before you put products on a, on a ship, um, and you'll avoid lots and lots of headaches. Um, but in terms of product compliance, how, how we sort of approach it is, is have, a, have a limited range. Um, you know, you don't want to spend loads and loads of money initially, um, you know, enough to be able to, to, to break open the market. Uh, you need to be looking at assessment on all the ingredients, um, the packaging, uh, uh, packaging designs as well, uh, manufacturing registrations, things like that. So, I think it's touched on as well the, the claims on pack. Um, that's something that, that China are very hot on. Um, ridiculous claims. I think there was a product being passed around. I think it's there. Um, lots of lots of fun marketing claims, which uh, you know. We'd have no problem here in, in the UK, uh, but the, the Chinese regulators will actually ask for proof for some of these funny marketing claims. 
and obviously, you know, they're, they're quite out there. So um, if you can't provide them, uh, you, you might need to, to rejig your, your packaging. Yeah, so I think Ali, you mentioned uh, that as well. I say generally, uh, we're a bit fluffier and over here, we kind of, we, we kind of like new things and quirky things and uh, the rest of the world is a little bit more conservative and uh, questions a lot more. So we're actually going back to uh, uh, what Patrick said earlier about Julian, like the lucky people that are skeptical. Uh, they're a lot more skeptical about what we consider. Mm -hmm. Miles a day how she works. Yeah, yeah, they have yeah, 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 seen yeah, yeah, through all of yeah. that, and um, mm -hmm. they're a lot more functional in the way that they look at things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Red, Red Bull gives you rings, definitely. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the of that bar. Actually, one of the claims that's covered is I think established two million BC because it's a primal. Yeah. Bar, and uh, you know, one of the typical incorporation from two million BC. So it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, actually comes up, which is but a shame. But it just but that's a culture that's not allowed to think for itself. That's not well, to get that. Yeah, that's a big part of it. That's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So certainly, um, you know, product compliance is, is the first one to to get to get right um, and ready yourself. Um, talked about for uh, getting getting yourself that translated and, and localized can can really help. Um, you know, engage the buyer, really get them on board in terms of the brand story, uh, what they're all about. Um, sometimes the, the Chinese audience uh, brand needs to be repositioned, and we, we usually advise on that um, because what what uh, consumers uh, and, and retail buyers might uh, you know really respond to here very different or can be different. You know, over over. And I've got to say, I've got a lot of I know some cracking stories of brand. This isn't just necessarily in China, where um, there's certain parts of Britishness or Englishness that the Far East interpret in a different way. So I know the kind of jam sells jams in uh, in the Far East that don't ever get sold in the UK, and they're just like specific blends uh, that they've created just for that marketplace. So you know, that sort of stuff can happen as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll try and run through so the chips don't get cold. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Keyword, yes. Exactly. Um, how, how we work is, is we have a syndicated sales team um, where we represent, represent your brand in, in the right way. Um, Enjoy, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> that. Um, so we, we identify uh, and vet um, potential partners. So... Uh, again, mentioned before, but there's a lot of people that will say we'll get you in everywhere, um, and we, you know, we've got access to all of this. Um, do they really? So, you know, there's some due diligence involved around, um, you know, who who their customers actually are and how big a pay they are. Uh, you know, their, can they pay, etc. Um, so we do all that. We forward on those those qualified leads to yourselves, um, so you get uh, really early access uh, into the conversation. Um, and, and, and be part of that early on. Um, send, send them samples, and we we follow up in market um, that, that conversation, that negotiation with those those partners. Um, whether that's you know uh, a strategy of we want to find that one importer that can take everything, or whether you'd rather you know looking at the right retailers, high end retailers, and going direct, and then building out from there. So it depends on you know what your what your strategy is and what you're most comfortable with. Um, would you advise having one distributor for the whole of um, China? I mean, when I was working with the China Britain Business Council, it's a huge, huge market, and our advice to a lot of British companies at the time was that you, know, you might have someone in the north, but they're probably not going to be able to deal exactly. with uh, exactly. you know, uh, Guangzhou or you know, the other provinces um, you know, further south. Uh, exactly, yeah. although they will tell you they can. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> National coverage. So yeah, there's uh, absolutely multiple partners, um, and not sort of running like before you can walk. So perhaps starting with one who's, who's got strongholds um, in one particular region, uh, and even some are very really strong in food service and Hereka. So you can split it up that way as well. Yeah. Um, so making sure you don't give them exclusivity because you could yeah. shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. Not unless it's tied to some very big volumes because absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So sometimes you can split it by your north, China, east, south, and west, yeah. or by population in what province or cities. You can even bits that level. Um, it depends on the strategy you want to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. 
What's the shipping time? How long does it take to ship to China? About 25 days. Um, so yeah, just really briefly on on um, our approach. So as we said before, you know there is one way of, of trying to do it yourself. Uh, how we work, we work with a number of brands in, in here in the UK as well. Um, China based. Uh, we've got an office in Fuzhou, uh, which is in between Shanghai and Shenzhen. It's a really nicely positioned in that uh, southeast corner. There's lots of those red dots. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we also have an office here in the UK, so that point of contact locally means that you guys have a finger on the pulse, um, and it's not just shipping product and hope for the best. Um, so we will translate the sales deck, um, and we'll represent you ongoing. Uh, we'll take a commission, an eight percent commission on, on sales we generate, um, and we'll account manage those um, ongoing, um, looking for, for new opportunities. So forgive me, all, all the people in the, your brochure, they're all retained clients, are they? So, so we, we um, for some of those, uh, we just represented them at the FFC. At the start at first. Yeah, at yeah. the, at the right. trade show, which yeah. is an option because there's, so there's one. Presumably thing. this is not an exhaustive to, to list either, so you've got other clients. So, so we, we so only 12 to 18 months old, so we don't work right. with hundreds and hundreds of brands, um, and that's another yeah. good benefit is yeah. there is focus it's, on... It's a big cost. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, we have a you know a certain number of brands that we work with absolutely. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that the uh, uh, the beauty of these guys is there's obviously you know if you're exporting to somewhere like China, there's so many pitfalls. Mm. And you know I kind of I've known from my friends that I've worked with, we've been twining to do you know put factories out there, to make yeah. huge, huge, yeah. huge losses. Yeah, uh, like we speak, it's kind of trying to set them up right now. It's hugely complicated. Well, I wish you luck. <laughs> We've been working at this China program. We'll, we'll talk with you over lunch, if you like, because I think yeah, that can okay. help us. Um, I wish I'd known about 18 months ago, but then you haven't had the idea yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it saves us a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, catch up. Catch up. Okay, um, thanks. Um, but t today only uh, because you know we'd love to love to work with some of the brands. Uh, not met all of you yet, but some of the products that you know, Ali with your with your range there, crackers etc. You know, really exciting time for, for China. So we've got a, a one-off um, price for, for you guys here if you'd like to sign up um, and get going with the approach that we we take with with China. Um, can I just ask? Is this course, is just for people here, or can we open that out to other people that we can, that are part of the export club? Uh, yeah, we could we could talk talk about that um, around around the you know the members um, that, are, that are part of that. Um, happy to, to send that out. It's also um, what I would say around around this is you know China's regulation very broad. So there, there's some high risk categories. You know whether it's uh, meat, dairy, baby milk, etc. Um, they're high risk. Organic mm -hmm. as well. I don't know, yeah, I'd love to hear your organic stories. Um, uh -huh. Good. <laughs> Which are definitely more, more tricky and more lengthy than your typical, you know, six week registrations for labeling and, and, and things like that. So um, I would uh, just, just highlight that for you guys. But yeah, I'd love to, love to speak to you in one to ones or over lunch. Um, and yeah, ask, ask away. Can I just add one thing? Absolutely. Uh, one problem we had with China, which has caused us a real issue, was our brand name because somebody registered it. Yeah. And yeah. It took us a long time and a certain amount of cost to get it back. So if you are going there and you haven't registered it, register it ASAP because they will take it. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that. Um, so yeah, it's a big issue. They, they, trade, they can trademark spots. Uh, so it's the first file system over there. So uh, although they are getting better and they are supporting you know, brands that can um, prove that you know, they actually trade under that name, um, you do have companies that will hold hundreds of trademarks, um, waiting for you to one day launch into the market, similar to domains um, some years ago. And uh, and yeah, unfortunately, part, part of that. So yeah, great to, to get that, tick that box early on. Especially before you do any trade shows in that direction and show that interest because they'll snap it up. Yeah, that's true. And that's, that's something that we, we help um, our partners with.